Jesus teaches us that your brother is the mirror in which you see the reflection of yourself as long as the perception lasts. You see how he puts that at the end. Your brother is the mirror in which you see the reflection of yourself as long as the perception lasts. Hmm, that's very positive. I like the last part. Like you can drop the you can drop the faulty perception in any instant you want, as long as the perception lasts. So so basically, I know when I traveled around the United States, for example, you know every year I would do all these travels. I would I would go to course groups and. Uh, I would hear the same thing. They would be studying the Course and they would say things like to me, well, I, I got this person, I can't stand to be around them, or I got this job, it's a dead-end job, I feel depressed being at this job, or I have this family member that I can't stand. But, but I know the Course is telling me all I have to do is change my mind. I don't have to do anything, I just have to change my mind. So I'd say, good, good. So then I'd go around, come back, six months, eight months later, they'd be talking about the same pre people, six months later. Then I go back in a year, I hear the same story, the same story. They would give me the same story and they say, and the Course is telling me all I have to do is just change my mind. And I was like, hmm, this is, that was more like an excuse <laughs> than, than a plan of action, you know, of, of healing. And so, what we start to realize is that the only point of noticing a reflection of something that rubs you the wrong way, you don't agree with, you don't feel, you resonate with, you're not comfortable around, is to see what it is that you're still holding on to in your mind, and then to actually really change your mind <laughs> and release that thing. If you're looking at them and you're thinking, so arrogant, then Jesus is like, hmm, maybe there's a little spot of pride in there that you need to clean the mirror of the mind a little with this. And then when you can really see it, like, oh yeah, I'm, what I don't like about them, they're boastful. Oh, have I ever been boastful? Because Jesus says, you never hate your brother for his sins, but only for your own. So we're always dealing with our thoughts and grievances in the mind, which is, it's just a trick to think that they're, they're acted out by the people, because they're just a so projection. That's just an ego trick for blame, victimization, and all the other ego uh, emotions, anger, all that stuff is all part of projection. So that's the, the thing, what Jesus is saying, ultimately to accept the Atonement is to change your mind about your mind. Change your mind from believing that you're a dream character to seeing that you're dreaming the dream and then letting go of even the dream. Uh, what If God created you as spirit, what do you need a dream for? No, <laughs> what's the point of a dream? But, but that's where that inner work comes in. You see how, that's why I call it self-honesty. You really, if you really are upset with somebody, it, it, you really have to take it in and go, hmm, what is it that they're reflecting back to me that I have to be right about, or that I'm so sure that I'm this way and they're something different, that they're different, that we're not the same one, you know, that they're different. That's how the projection starts, and the only way to bring about to a full end is, is to really even in 12 steps, they say you have to admit that you have to admit the problem. You have to admit the addiction before you can be taken beyond the the addiction to the healing. So that's that's what it is. You don't don't try to do it kind of at a at a personal level either, because people say that person is clearly sloppy and lazy, and this person is clearly not sloppy and lazy. And Jesus is like, well, where did the concepts of sloppiness and laziness come from in the first place? Did God create you sloppy or them sloppy? Did God, you know, where you have to take it all the way back to what ideas come from God and what ideas are purely inventions. And, and the mirroring is really at the mind level. It's 
the, the lesson is over. I know I've heard course teachers that say, you have relationship classrooms and you have work classrooms and you have all these things. Now, I asked Jesus about that one time. He said, no, no, the, the classroom is the mind. You don't have any relationship classrooms. You have all mind, only the mind is the classroom. The mind learned false beliefs and now it has to unlearn them. It has to give them away, give them back to the Holy Spirit. The, the lessons are never at the level of linear time. The lessons are always for the mind. So that's why when I was traveling early on and I would say, look at that one over there and look at this one and Jesus was always, it's your lesson, it's your lesson, it's your lesson, your lesson, your lesson. <laughs> Jesus was always like, your lesson, but, but they, your lesson, your lesson, you know, it was like, because we're, we're used to trying to have it be interpersonal. We're used to say, I'm only partly to blame, but you see what they did to me? And Jesus is like, your lesson, your lesson, you know. It has to be solved at the mind level. And that's why we have to really, he says, uh, it, is, it is with your thoughts alone that we must work. He doesn't say it's with your thoughts and behaviors that we must work. He says it is with your thoughts alone that we must work. It's what in 12 steps they call it the stinking thinking. That's what 12 steps is saying. You have to get in touch with the stinking thinking and you have to pray to the higher power for to be released. And the Course is really saying the same. So in the world of form, the um, people or whatever is going on um, is irrelevant to the, to the real, true reality of what is going on in the mind. And so it's not about um, holding on to that relationship or like, you know, like a marriage, you know, we talk about, you know, the, the divorce, it's like, well, no, you shouldn't. You should stay together and figure out what's wrong with your head, you know. Why is this a conflict? Um, but that's confusing levels. Is that what, am I getting that? Like, is that yeah. the world of form? It's not about that. It's, yeah, it's you know, recognizing that there's yeah. something coming up if you really look at those early workbook lessons, early on Jesus has a lesson, my thoughts are images I have made. He's actually saying that what you think of as external circumstances and external people are not external at all. In fact, the whole point of A Course in Miracles workbook lesson is to show you that there is no inner and outer. That that my thoughts are images I've made. So let's say you have a particular person you're dealing with and you say, this is difficult, this is challenging. Well, it's challenging because of the projection that, that, that they're out there. And, you know, ultimately the, the ultimate realization is there's no out there out there. there. There isn't an inner life of thoughts and an external life of projected images. That's why he's got that lesson in there. My thoughts are images I have made. So when people ask me, you know, I'm traveling around all these years, three and a half decades doing this and this, and they'll say, they'll bring up somebody I've known maybe 20 years ago. They'll say, oh, how's so-and-so doing? I say, great. And they say, when was the last time you talked to them? I said, 20 years ago. How do you know they're doing great? Because they're in my mind. I'm doing great, so they're doing great. You see, there is no world, this is lesson 132, there is no world apart from what you think. There is no out there, out there. We're dealing with a perceptual hallucination in the mind, and Jesus is just in there with the angel saying, come on, come on, you can get it. <laughs> it's, there's no external world. In Lesson 132, he says, first he comes in soft, there is no world apart from what you think. Aha! He's still saying the same thing. There is no world apart from what you think. It's a thought problem. It's an ego thought problem. That's what the problem is. And the Holy Spirit's already handled it. So he's like saying, be willing to give up this ego thought problem, because this is what the separation is. This is what the fall from grace is. It's a thought problem. God thunk you, 
into being as the Christ, and you're trying to think up something else, a flesh creature. Identifying as body. Yeah. And that character, and not identifying. Yeah. And so, therefore, feeling all the effects on the uh, character. Yeah, There's, and he's got so many ways for us to practice. Like, for example, um, when you get to lesson 136, sick, sickness is a defense against the truth. He's going to be teaching us that all illness is mental illness. That is a beautiful line from Jesus. All illness is mental illness. What about physical illness? He said, no, all illness is mental illness because there's no problem apart from the mind. It's a thought problem. It's a thinking problem. And of course, where do these crazy thoughts come from? From the ego belief system. It's a belief underneath all those crazy thoughts. So really, if you work those workbook lessons, all he's trying to do is saying, no, the problem isn't what you think. You think it's that government, you think it's that person, you think it's that partner. No, no, no. It's your lesson, it's your lesson, your lesson. And eventually you start to go, thank you Jesus, well you really have got a one-track mind there. <laughs> I guess it's my lesson here. If I'm upset, that's my lesson. That's my forgiveness lesson. If I'm happy, well that's my lesson too. That's Holy Spirit's like, <laughs> go, go for the happy lesson, go for the forgiveness, for the atonement. And then he says, the Holy Spirit leads happy learners. So you can see this whole collapse between the outer and the inner is really helping us out. Because then we can have full responsibility for our state of mind. How am I going to be happy with all these crazy, kamaskazi, external people going around? You know, you you think everything's going good and then they say and do things that you didn't expect ever to hear. You say, what? Say, what? <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> and Jesus is like, go on, go on, <laughs> don't forget, go on. And that's, that's where it, it, it takes, a, takes practice to, to really be convinced about that. But that's what A Course in Miracles is really about. It's a mind training program to start to stop the blame, stop the victimization stories, stop the, the interpretation that somebody, not yourself, is doing something to you, uh, to you against your will. That's basically uh, what this whole world is. Saying something's going wrong and, and it's something other than my mind. If someone or something would change other than my mind, I would be happy. <laughs> Jesus, no, you're less. <laughs> Everything, since there's just one mind or oneness, however you look at that, I like how Jesus says, when you meet anyone, remember it's a holy encounter. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you will treat yourself. As you think of him, him, you will think of yourself. Never forget this, for in him you will find yourself or lose yourself. Very much like the biblical, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I am there. And that's what or, like. Yeah, and Jesus does say that the Holy Spirit, the temple of the Holy Spirit is a relationship. It's not the body. The temple of the Holy Spirit is a relationship. So, this is where, this is where inequality ends. This is where um, the roles have to end. You know, so often when people are identified as being in an interpersonal relationship, like a partnership, there's a set of baggage that comes with the partnership. And that baggage is coming from the past. It's the ego's gift. Oh, here's a present for you, the past. And, and this baggage comes with roles. Oh, you need to do this, and you need to do this. And for, for most relationships, couples, they're, they're always navigating this role thing. You know, is it your role? Is it my role? Well, I did it last time, so you do it this time. And that's the ego's way of making it equal. 
I did it last time, you do it this time, you know. <laughs> That's the ego's way of trying to even things out. And, and actually what Jesus says in the Song of Prayer is that if two people pray together and are really attuned, that they will hear the same thing at the same time. Wow, that's beautiful. Because then you can see that through the prayer and through the guidance that, that everything will just unfold beautifully as a given from the Holy Spirit. But if you're still trying to navigate it as a, in a, as a person, you know, almost like if you have an equation for the relationship, and then somebody does something outside of the equation. Wait, why'd you do that? That's not our agreement. Also, I find um, when I would do counsel people and couples and everything, or even in the early years of community, they would be, they just wouldn't really know what they wanted. But, but I would say, well, you, why don't you pray together or talk it out and come up with some shared agreements and even if you put faith in those shared agreements, they may only last for a period of time, because they're temporary. But at some point you can just say, this shared agreement isn't working anymore. You can just say, let's, okay, let's have another shared agreement. You see, there's a cordialness, there's a friendliness, there's, you know, when I am have an agreement with somebody and they come to me and they say, I can't do this anymore. I say, okay, <laughs> you know. What can you do? Well, I feel I could do this and this and this. Oh, good, good. Let's do that then. You see, there's a, there's a flow with it. It's not like holding each other to something. You swore you would do this and what, what did I sign in blood? You know, what, what, you know we're, we're not here to try to lock ourselves into time and space. We're here to open up our hearts to the Holy Spirit and then let the inspirations of the Holy Spirit come through us. And that's beautiful because then you you can really take responsibility for your state of mind. You don't have to pawn it off on you make me mad or you upset me or you did this to me. You know, you see how the ego is always going to try to point the finger at something or someone in the world and make it be about them. So I think that's beautiful. I, I, that feels like what you witnessed was like a, a holy encounter there, and you were part of it. You could, yeah. you could feel Jesus there. You could feel I am here. Yeah, and that love. I used to, uh, like when I was living with my family when I was younger. There would be like Jehovah's Witnesses or, or someone walking door to door. And I would just wait until they came to the door and rang the doorbell or something. And so I'd run to the door to get the door, and the rest of the family would run <laughs> to, the, to the back of the house <laughs> to get away, to hide in the back room. And, you know, I'd, my parents, you'd let them into the house? Yes. I offered them a drink? Yes. You have a nice chat with them? Yes. But they don't believe what we believe. We love Jesus. I would rejoice in the love of Jesus with, with you know, I, I wasn't there to split hairs, I was to join, I was to connect so we could rejoice in Jesus. And then you're not trying to, this isn't kind of a bargaining thing, trying to shape somebody's interpretation or belief system, it's to rejoice in the actuality of wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I am there. So to me, those are the kind of things that I would enjoy. Some, I was in the Mormon Temple Square one time with a group of people and there were missionaries all over dressed up in their uniforms and men and women just swarming with, with missionaries and finally two female missionaries came up. I was with maybe seven or eight people and these two came up, and the one, she almost looked like she had a joy, but a fire in her eyes. And I was like, oh goody, I was like, oh goody. And then she went around, and she went up to all people I was with, and she kept looking right into each one's eyes, and she would say, will you pray with me? And they, will you pray with me? 
will you pray with me? They come to Lisa, will you pray with me? Lisa's like, what are we talking about here? She went right to the next one, will you pray with me? So she finally comes around to me and she looks me right in the eye. She goes, will you pray with me? And I said, I pray without ceasing. She went, oh, that is so good. <laughs> That's what she was hoping for. <laughs> I pray without ceasing. Oh, she's you know, That's like the joy button. You know? That's because of the devotion, you know. That was what, oh, that's what she wanted to hear. She wasn't like trying to put anybody on the spot. She was just wanting somebody to fully join with her in the prayer to Jesus. So I think. That's the way it can be when we start to open ourselves up. We, we actually feel like there's a joining happening. Instead of running away from people, we, we can actually go toward them with enthusiasm. Like, oh, this could be fun. You know, is it like a child saying, well, this could be fun. This could be interesting. This could be fun. Mm -hmm. and, and that way you don't, you don't feel like you have to convince anybody of anything. You're not trying to change anybody's mind. You're just going to have an encounter to just accept them as they truly are and accept yourself as you truly are. You know, to really invite Jesus to be there in amongst you, to be the one that is inspiring the the encounter, you know. So to me that's that's just the way to live now. And there's certain things when you start to get into your guidance, there's things that you become more and more devoted. There's things that you just you don't think about, you don't you don't think about like things in the world or whatever, you know that whatever you experience in terms of appearances is all for your true humbleness, your, your true alignment with God. I know in Christian science, for example, they have Christian science practitioners. And the Christian science practitioners sole responsibility is just to stay in prayer and connection with God. That's it. That's their whole function. They only have one function, to stay in contact. So if somebody comes to see them and somebody says, I'm sick, can you help me? Then when they hear the words, I'm sick, can you help me or whatever, that, that to them is a claim. That is a claim against God. Sickness is a claim against God. It doesn't matter the form, the degree, whatever. I'm sick. I just, somebody stole $100,000 from me. Or I'm sick, I have cancer. No difference. A claim? A claim. <laughs> so you see how, how in Christian science, that's how they strengthen their connection with God, by, by starting to realize that anything that comes to them that's a claim saying, not God, they come back to God, you see? Mm -hmm. Or like Peace Program used to say, uh, she would just be out on the open road, walking, traveling, sleeping on her back under the stars, you know, living her, her lit life. And then she said, yeah, the funny thing is, anytime I seem to slide off track, a problem will come along and knock me back on. Wow, that's a way to live a life. A problem will come along and knock me back onto the track. Whoa, that's, that's a different way of looking at things than, oh, a real problem that I personally now have to figure out. She would say, that problem will come along, come along and knock me back onto the track, knock me back into my alignment with God. Now that's a good use for problems. <laughs> <laughs> that knock you that knock you back into alignment with God. You see how how wonderful that perspective is. It's very different than than we're used to as as human beings. You know, it's just we need examples like that. Yeah. Uh, it seems like in the last half a year or so, and then certainly just this weekend, the references to the Jesus movies. And how they, the, the, the Chosen and all these different Jesus movies that have come out, in, in my experience, it seems like they've just kind of flooded out recently. Mm -hmm. And how they all seem to have a very consistent story, a, a, a consistent understanding of Jesus. And that, 
certainly so accident it seems like a miracle right yeah. I mean, do you is that your experience too that like with all the different religions and all the different perceptions of jesus and that there's all this consistency with them yeah, right that's <laughs> pretty cool yeah it, it's beautiful i think yeah I, you start to just feel like an appreciation and it comes in it, with so many different things but i think that's just part of the mind feeling healing healing and feeling unified yeah just drawing forth lots and lots of witnesses and you just have a smile on your face like look at that one well look at that one you know it's it's like a, a happy reflection just a very very happy reflection David, can you talk a little bit more about that um, story that you shared about some students and teachers that get stuck in some stories? What is like behind that? Because, yeah, I don't know, something resonates here because sometimes I, I, I feel that it's tricky. Ego is like, oh, you are doing your forgiveness job, you are forgiving, you're, you are forgiving the situation, you are being uh, honest, transparent, and authentic, but it feels like the mind is not really changing. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be very tricky, this, like, telling the story, like, even, like, expressing and like, not really feeling the change or really feeling the sure. forgiving forgiveness uh, yeah maybe you can talk more about this because it feels tricky yeah I think it's it's really the purpose underneath the story or underneath the parable that that is so important you know and and really what we're learning from Jesus is that miracles are involuntary and shouldn't be under conscious control and the ego just still wants to at times consciously get in there. It wants some control. Mm -hmm. It wants control over the world, it wants control over the body, it wants control over the relationships, it wants control over when it tells stories. Uh, it, it really is trying to perpetuate itself and what Jesus and the Holy Spirit are really doing is helping us loosen from those old patterns. So sometimes <clears throat> somebody maybe comes and they're, they're very, very talkative and they like to talk, talk, talk all the time, talk non-stop. And then the Spirit will say, ah, just pause and ask yourself, why are you telling the stories? You see, that gets underneath the mm -hmm. pattern of just nervously talking, 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 telling stories. There may be someone else who comes that's very quiet and they very close down and the Spirit wants them to open up and that is a, is a shift that will be very helpful. Uh, many years ago I traveled um, I traveled with two women and one had been in the convent from like age 14 to 22 and she felt like sexually she was extremely repressed. She was, had denied and repressed all of her sexual urges and emotions for all those years in the convent from like 14 to 22 and the other woman had been experimenting sexually and saw herself as much more promiscuous, the exact opposite. So when they came together, it was an opportunity to heal uh, their, their, their experiences around the body. So for the woman who, who was very, in her own words, sexually repressed, I remember being traveling down in Florida with her at one point and and I, we stopped in some spiritual store, metaphysical store, whatever, and they had uh, a poster on there that said, um, uh, Course in Miracles Hypnosis. We can hypnotize you and help you get to your issues. So she, 
She said, I think I'm supposed to go. So under hypnosis, she was able to get in touch with some of the things that were going on in her mind. Then another time um, I was with her and and I was just going to see how is Jesus going to do this. They, we went into a store, somebody gave us a flyer. They, the flyer was, come and join our Course in Miracles group at this nudist colony. Course in Miracles group. This is how Jesus works, you see. He works with somebody who's the flying nun, who's in the, in the convent from 14 to 22, and he takes him to a Course in Miracles hypnotherapist. Uh, she goes, she said, you want to come in? I said, no, I'll just drop you off. <laughs> so I dropped her off there and she, went, later on I picked her up and she told me the whole story of how this Course in Miracles group met in this nudist colony and all the lessons that she was learning in there. Another time she was with me and we were listening to two kind of really world famous Course in Miracles uh, teachers from the early years who had taken the course all over the world, many different continents. And so we were walking alongside them. She said, I think I'm supposed to go with them. And these teachers took the whole Course in Miracles gathering down to the creek beds of Sedona, where they took their clothes off and went skinny dipping. You see, this is how Jesus works. He has to work with the mind that has guilt around certain things. Jesus knows that they're not, it's not real guilt, but the mind that believes in things Imagine being in the convent from 14 to 22, all these reinforced beliefs about the, the body and the shame and the guilt and what you can't do and can't, can't do to express your sexuality. Jesus, little by little, <coughs> brings us into encounters and experiences that helps us loosen from the guilt. Right now, we have a center uh, where two of the participants at the center have like unconscious trauma that's still tied into experiences they had in their life where they were raped or were raped one of them a couple times and now in a safe environment in a place where there's lots of nurturing love and support and they can get in touch with the trauma and, and allow it to come up and that's where the healing can occur it has to occur in a sense of safety and security so I've seen this happen over and over many, many years ago. I think I was in Ohio. I was, I was going to show this, um, it was a Barbara Streisand movie. She was starring in it, but in the movie she had gone through uh, sexual abuse. And when I showed the movie, then one of the women in the audience, it brought up her, her trauma, her sexual trauma, and then she, but she couldn't even look at me because she said, I can't look at you because you're a man. So I had one of my students who was a female go off with her and they went to a room to let it come up into awareness to heal. So that's generally how you can see how the Holy Spirit and Jesus work. It's to, it's to allow the darkness to come up, but in some kind of safe context where it can be reinterpreted, where the Holy Spirit's interpretation can come in. And that's definitely what happened with my friend who was traveling with me, because through the, the uh, hypnosis, through the, uh, the course group at the nudist colony, and then through the skinny dipping episode with all these people, each time there was a loosening of the, the way it was wired in there with the ego that was bringing about the guilt, to bring about a, a different interpretation. And I, sometimes she could say, wow, I had this miraculous experience where I could look back on a scene from the past, which I had judged in a very, it was very traumatic to me, and I could see the scene from a higher place. It was literally describing the, the seeing the scene through forgiveness very graphically describing everything, like without the same charge. So it's like, it's teaching us, we're really never upset be because of what happened to us, but we're upset because of our interpretation of what happened to us. And we're never upset between the things that seem to happen to us in form, 
because ultimately Jesus will teach us that they're not happening at all. We're, we're hallucinating <laughs> these, the whole thing. You know, we're hallucinating everything of time and space. And, and once we can get to that place of reinterpretation, then we'll be willing to let go of the dream. But until that point comes, he just brings us these miracle opportunities where it's pretty obvious, you know. I, I know when I was traveling with her, she felt like, wow, I seem to have all this stuck. I'm stuck in all these things and I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you watch, Jesus is the master. He'll, he'll bring just those experiences you need to reinterpret that. And, and that's how it goes for all of us. So we just have to stay really open to the guidance. If, we, if we're not open to the guidance, then it's more like we're just, we're still afraid of something and we're trying to hide uh, from the light. And uh, we don't want to hide from the light, we want to just let it come to us. But it comes beautifully, it's like we don't have to go like on some kind of search and destroy mission with the ego, it's more like, oh, I offer my willingness to you, Jesus, and you bring me the experiences I need to release whatever I need to release. What a beautiful prayer! All of us can pray that prayer. That's, that's a beautiful prayer. Just heal me, you know how. <laughs> I'll step back and let you lead the way. And whoa, <laughs> here it comes. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. Uh, since you started talking about sex issues, uh, why are they so um, powerful? Like sex relationship, um, much more stronger than just relationship between, say, friends. We you know attachment to uh, relationships and that involves sex, or you know um, how emotional we get. Or uh, I am. Um, when, for example, I'm watching a movie and there is a violent scene, but if it involves a rape, I have a much stronger reaction. I just cannot watch it. I, I was never raped. Uh, but still, you know, I, um, I just cannot stand it. It's very strong for me and uh, I bet for many people in general, not, not just for me. When it comes to sex, it's like, wow. Yes. Yeah. Well, deeper down in the mind, the deeper you go, you start to realize that everyone who comes to this world and everyone who comes seemingly into time and space is drawn by guilt. It's like they're, it's mostly unconscious, but people always say to me, I, I'm tired of reincarnating. I want this over. <laughs> I would rather go back to the light. If I go to a near-death experience and I get close to that light and they send me back, I'm, no, I'm not going. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not going back. I'm going to the light, you know. I'm going to be firm with the light this time. No, can't get rid of me so quick. But every, when the mind's asleep and it still has unconscious guilt, it's drawn to uh, reincarnation or incarnation. I have a friend named Alan who has, his, uh, for many years, 20 some years, his, his uh, signature on his email is, seriousness causes reincarnation. <laughs> that's, his, that's his handle. So where it comes to sexuality is, is the Holy Spirit is the mechanism in the mind it wants to give and share and extend because God only gives. God doesn't know what getting is. But the ego is the getting mechanism in the mind. So when it comes down to sexual urges or, or hunger or thirst or any of the, we'll say like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, remember the you had the big pyramid, the basic needs, and working your way up to the self-actualization needs. That once you realize that the ego is the getting mechanism in the mind, and that when you have a desire to get something from somebody, then that's the ego. And, 
And when you get into like romantic relationships, the getting mechanism is much more active, you know, than it is with friendships and so forth. And that getting mechanism is the guilt. And that's where the charge is. That's where the trauma is. God only gives. God only extends love. God doesn't understand what getting means. But for the human being, for the consciousness that's asleep and dreaming, and it, it seems to have separated itself into different aspects of consciousness, then that's what Jesus calls the attraction to guilt. He's got a section in his, uh, his text called the attraction to guilt. So, if you go, well, what does that even mean, attraction to guilt? It sounds sick. It is sick. <laughs> attraction to guilt. He's got three sections in there, attraction to guilt, first time I read that, I was like, ah, oh, that is sick. Then I read the next section, attraction to pain. That's sick, two sick ones in a row. And then I read the third one, attraction to death. Oh, that's sick, sick, sick. And Jesus is like, yeah, sick, mm-hmm. The ego is sick. If you believe in the ego, you have an attraction to guilt, you have an attraction to pain, you have an attraction to death. Maybe not consciously, but unconsciously, yes. That's what Carl Jung called the shadow. There it is. So, there's a line in the Course where Jesus says, it is impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. Whoa! Big time. This is the master psychologist. This is not a psychologist. This is the master psychologist who's transcended time and space, who's, who's one with God. This is the way, the truth, and the life speaking. Oh, let's look at that sentence again. It's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. Okay, master psychologist, maybe you can clarify what is the attraction to guilt, what is this pleasure pain thing, and basically says, you think that pleasure and pain are different in your perception. You're attracted to one and you're, you're avoidant of the other. But they're actually the same. Pleasure and pain are both the same. How are pleasure and pain both the same is they both reinforce the perception of the body being real. And anybody who's ever gone through a migraine headache or an orgasm knows what I'm talking about. They reinforce the body as being real. And Jesus says, you are spirit. God created you as spirit. You are spirit. You are forever spirit. But if you believe in the ego, you have things that are not reaching your awareness. Certainly for me, before I read A Course in Miracles, if somebody had told me in grade school, preschool, high school, or probably even university, if I was in a psychology class in university and somebody said, it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain, I'd say, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> that seems to be counterintuitive. That just, how can I relate to that? But Jesus does more than just say it. He gives us the full context in the Course that you have to follow your purpose, your Holy Spirit purpose, to wake up to God. You need miracles. You want something that you can practice on a daily basis? Miracles. You want something you can call on in any temptation, in any darkness that you experience? Miracles. That's why we need miracles, that's why we need prayer. We, we need to be prayerful. And you can see, if you put what I'm talking about right now with what I started off with, that, that this Course will, will be believed entirely or not at all, you can start to see where this is going. Like, if you're going to really go for spiritual awakening, you have to go for it with everything that you've got. You have to put your heart into, you know, if your heart's in it, then 
there you will find your treasures, your spiritual treasures. And if your heart's not in it, oh, believe me, the ego can easily come up with a lot of alternatives to God. And this is where it's so mystifying for human beings, because that's something that, for example, Jesus says, the ego does not want this connection raised up into awareness. What connection? That it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. The ego does not want that one brought up into conscious awareness. Because as soon as you're consciously aware of it, would you put, keep putting your hand on a, on, a, on a burning stove? If you knew what it was, you know, would you go, would you go back and would you put your hand there again? You, you would say, no, I think I love myself <laughs> too much, I will not go there. But so much of spiritual awakening is raising it into awareness. And I think when you watch a scene like that in a movie, the reason it's, it's so charged is because there's still something unconscious that is triggered by perceiving that kind of scene. And the, the point of heightened perception is to, is to bring your perception with the Holy Spirit. And as you go bring it to the Holy Spirit, then, then you stay, the mind stays very calm, it's not uh, disturbed. Because it's not interpreting, it's not interpreting a crime, it's not interpreting a, a violation, it's not, you see, when we get up with the Holy Spirit, all things work together for good. You see, it goes way beyond the human perception of what's happening in form. So that's, that's like a short answer to it, that, that it's really a call to start to raise unconscious beliefs up into the mind. And once you're consciously aware of them, then it's like, oh, okay, I, I would rather be a miracle worker than to keep falling into these ego pitfalls. I would rather, uh, there's a line in the Course that says, all real pleasure comes from doing God's will. There's the interpretation that, that heals, all real pleasure. Jesus, even one point, he says, you cannot tell the difference in your sleepy, deceived state of mind. You cannot tell the difference between pain and joy. Wow. Can't tell the difference between pain and joy? And Jesus says, that's right, because if you could tell the difference, you would only experience joy. Oh. <laughs> you see, that's deep. That's deep. On the surface of the human being, wait a minute. I can tell the difference, Jesus. I wasn't born yesterday. <laughs> I can tell the difference between pain and joy. Oh, if you could, you would never experience the pain, you would only experience the joy, if you could consciously see that. So that shows you how, how amazingly high the mind training goes. Yeah. And it also demystifies things. <laughs> so, in a working relationship, in a, in a relationship guided by the Holy Spirit, romance is not existent. Because romance is pleasure. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of how you describe the romance. I mean, the way typically romance is defined is is there is a there is a getting mechanism underneath there, and then as you really let go, then the the perception of the relationship is transformed. But I mean, that's like like Johnny was saying, I I want a holy relationship. And when we say, I want a holy relationship, then we're really giving an invitation to the light to show us our own holiness, to take us into that transcendent state. Like the Course Workbook says, there's nothing my holiness cannot do. Ooh, you know, wow. <laughs> That's, that doesn't sound very limiting. But, but once again, I think the way Jesus works is, 
he works with attraction to the light. So like with my, my friend I was traveling with who had all the sexual repression, Jesus was orchestrating experiences that would help loosen the repression. Just like the one who was very quiet, Jesus will slowly help them open up to let the Spirit speak through them. And the one that talks all the time, Jesus is like, listen, listen. You know, you see, it's not like a, a cookie cutter approach. It's always very gentle and loving to bring the mind more into the fullness of, of its true, true reality. So it's, yeah, I think that line, all real pleasure comes from doing God's will. That's, that kind of is a very transcendent state of mind, but that's, that's what the goal is, yeah. Thank you. All, all symptoms come from not doing God's will. Yeah. All symptoms come from not doing God's will. So, so that fits with when we want joy, the Holy Spirit's curriculum is a curriculum of joy, then, yeah, that's, that's the direction we go towards. We don't go to try to figure out the symptoms, we go towards, toward the light, yeah. Which intuitively makes, again, it, it, it resonates, you know, it's like it's not trying to eliminate problems, it's, it's more towards going toward the light, to the joy, in which there, is, there are no problems. It's very different than our problem-solving approaches, <laughs> you know, that the ego is quite proud of. Oh, I, I have good backup problem-solving approaches. Jesus is like, well, maybe you can let go of the problem. <laughs> wow, what are we going to title this one tonight? We had a humdinger of a title last night. <laughs> St. Augustine Retreat, Marriage, Divorce, and Eternity, but what should we call this one? <laughs> Dissolving the Ego. <laughs> Dissolving the Ego, yeah. That's a good one. That's what it feels like. St. Augustine Retreat, Dissolving the Ego. Yeah. It's a lot to digest. <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot there, but you can feel how rich it is, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I can, you can just feel your heart wanting to say, yeah, this is what I can dive into. This is what I've been yearning for, is to really dive into it. This is the continuity that we were talking about on the very first night. Mm -hmm. we, we were saying, we yearn for continuity, and spiritual awakening is, is where we really feast on the continuity, you know, the present moment. We can start to feel it coming closer to awareness. <laughs>